Good afternoon and welcome to Kaiser Music Session number five entitled Two Mallet Concert Playing. Uh, today's session is being led by Michael Wyatt. Mr. Wyatt has been active in the marching community for nearly two decades. As a performer, he was a two-time member of the WGI World Class Finalist United Percussion and was also on the front ensemble captain for the nine-time world champion Hawthorne Caballeros from 2005 through 2009. Mr. Wyatt holds a bachelor of music and jazz per studies percussion performance from the University of Arts and is currently pursuing his master's in music education at Central Connecticut State University. He is currently the instrumental music director at West Hill High School in Stanford, Connecticut, where he oversees all of the instrumental programs there. Please welcome Mr. Michael Wyatt. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming today. Um, Thank you for that introduction, Dr. Hayward. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the two mallet playing. Uh, we're going to focus primarily on concert percussion playing here. And I'm going to go over a couple of the beginning steps at the very to start here. And I want to make sure that we're all speaking the same language. Uh, so I'm going to start like bare bones for just a minute, bear with me. So, uh, I'm assuming most of you are probably gonna know this, but the keyboard, any keyboard that you have, marimba, xylophone, vibraphone, uh, bells, anything like that, is set up very much like a piano, set to two and three, like the black keys on a piano, and those will be further away from you. And when you go next to the group of two, to the left of the group of two is the note called C. Um, the anatomy of the instrument, these are called resonators. Um, they help really uh, produce the tone and project the tone, make it resonate out towards the audience. Where the string goes through is called the node, um, and that's very important because you don't want to play on the node ever. Um, so we have the node there and um, obviously the keys themselves. Uh, just wanted to go over that real quick so we, like if I say things like the node or anything like that, you all know what I'm saying. So um, in my experience uh, as the director at West Hill, when I first got there, um, the majority of our middle schools and elementary schools did not have any mallet percussion instruments at the schools. So I would get incoming freshmen all of the time at the high school level who had no mallet playing expertise. They were uh, drummers. They had played uh, snare drum, bass drum. Uh, some of them had played some of the accessory instruments, uh, but very, very few of them even knew what these instruments were, let alone how to play them. So over the years, I've gotten a lot of experience with taking a drummer and transferring them to a percussionist and teaching them all of the different realms of percussion. So I'm going to start with that in mind of the idea that you have a basic understanding of, of how to play uh, how to use sticks implements to play an instrument uh, and kind of take that into the marimba playing. Um, so the first thing that I always talk about is the stance. How you stand and, and, and the way you move your body is extremely important to playing the instrument. Uh, it's very important when you're playing two mallets. Tomorrow we'll get more into four mallets, and it's even more important when you get into four mallet playing. The, you pretty much want the majority of what you're playing to be directly in front of you at all times. So uh, I, I see a lot of young percussionists sometimes kind of get stuck with their feet in like, like they're in the mud. And you want to be able to move. You, you want to be able to sidestep side to side a little bit and put the majority of what you're playing in front of you. Then hold them, hold the mallets pretty much just like a drumstick. Um, I, and when I'm doing concert playing, I choke up a little bit more than I do on a standard drumstick. Um, probably about 
about two fifths of the way up in in this case. Um, I will sometimes bring that down depending on the, the needs of the piece I'm playing. But uh, a third to two fifths, give or take, uh, up the, the shaft is a good starting point. Uh, and then from there, you're going to just use your wrist, just like you do when you're playing any drum, to strike what it is that you're striking. Um, so in this case, I am going to be aiming when I'm looking at my keys. If you look at the accidental row, the, the row that's away from you, from the node to the edge, there's somewhere, depending on the instrument that you have in front of you, probably somewhere between uh, an inch to two inches between the node and the very edge of the key. Your optimal spot generally to hit is the exact same length on the inside of the key. So you want to be going pretty much right over the resonator rail and the same thing applies to the naturals down here as well. So that's about where you want to be striking the keys and um, now a brief overview of stroke type. Um, a lot of drummers in my experience have the most amount of trouble with an upstroke. That's where you start with the mallet up and then you return up after playing. Most of them have a tendency to downstroke. And some of them even completely go to like a dead stroke where they push in all the way to the key. We want to uh, counteract that as much as possible and get an upstroke so that we can kind of think of drawing the sound out of the key. Um, and one of the big differences when you have drumming experience but limited mallet experience is that a roll on a mallet instrument is a single stroke roll. So you are probably used to, on a drum, doing some variation of a double stroke or multiple bounce roll in order to make a roll sound. On a mallet instrument, we want alternating strokes of single notes. The other thing here, just like with a drum, you do need to be able to um, make accommodations for the instrument you're specifically playing and the range that you're playing in. There's a commonality in percussion, in, in drum, snare drum rolls, that the louder the roll, you're going to need to use faster strokes. Uh, similarly here, you will need to be, you will need faster strokes on loud and slower strokes on low, on soft. But that also uh, changes on the range of the instrument. Down here on the low end, I don't need to roll nearly as fast as I do up here to make a smooth, continuous sound. And one of the things that I see very commonly is for people to uh, always be right hand dominant when they're coming from a drumming background. And it's very important on the mallet instrument, especially uh, and in drumming in general, but especially on a mallet instrument, that you're more ambidextrous, that you can use both directions. So, one of the first things that I learned when I started on mallet instruments, the uh, iconic Morris Goldenberg book that almost every mallet percussionist I've ever known has used. Um, they, the first page is all rolls. And so you start on a middle C and when you go up you lead with your right hand because that's the hand that's closest to the way you're going already. So your right hand goes first as you ascend the instrument but you learn very quickly that you have to lead with your left hand when you're going down. 
that makes it so much easier to maneuver around the keys. It's easy when you're doing scalar stuff like I just did to be able to still sneak in and be able to move your right hand first. But let's say if you're doing, say, an octave jump, if I'm going to jump back down the, my, the octave here with my right hand first, my left hand is in the way. I need to move the left hand first to try to make that as connected as possible. Uh, and stickings are your friend in all cases. Um, one of the exercises that I did um, when I was working on my early mallet chops was I would do a one octave scale uh, in all my keys because it, for the best way to, to do the sticking is to start with your left hand because the left hand's on the outside on the bottom end and the right hand's on the outside at the top end. So if you start with your left, it, it lays out pretty nicely on the sticking side of what you're doing. So it made me be left hand dominant, practicing all of my scales. left hand lead. Um, I'm still right hand dominant. I have, I play all sorts of percussion including drum set. I'm very, I'm right hand dominant on drum set, everything else. But m m making my left hand more mature by playing mallets was extremely beneficial to my overall approach to everything percussion. Um, in general, when you're playing uh, on the mallet instrument, you do want to alternate strokes. You do want to follow, uh, especially in rapid passages, uh, a right with a left and a left with a right. Uh, you don't want a lot of double strokes in there and triple strokes in there. You want to use both hands. However, sometimes some passages just make more sense with some of those things. Um, in a piece I'm going to play for you in just a couple of minutes, box violin concerto in A minor, very popular excerpt for young percussionists to play on a marimba. There's one part where you go from C above the staff to C below the staff in four notes. But it's 16th notes and it's really fast, so you need to find some way of sticking especially that last octave jump to make it work for you. Um, I have used right, left, left, right. And I've used right, left, right, right. To make that smoother for me. So you do need to be more conscientious about your sticking patterns as well when you're playing a mallet instrument. Um, because even though you are uh, developing the ambidexterity, some things just work much better for you when you do that. Um, so um, now with that said, I'm going to play um, a little less than half of the first movement of box Violin Concerto in A minor. And uh, I, the thing that I would like you to see is how I am using my stickings to make it um, a more manageable excerpt for myself. A lot of things are going to be left hand lead uh, because it makes more sense that way. There are some times that I'm going to need to use a sticking like that paradiddle sticking that I just talked about uh, just a minute ago. So uh, focus on how I'm playing what I'm playing. Um, I haven't really played this piece that much in the last couple of years, so I apologize if I had a couple wrong notes, but hopefully that won't happen.
So uh, hopefully what you saw in there was there were large por portions of that where I went left-hand lead. There were portions of that where I had to lead a roll with a right hand, lead a roll with a left hand, exit a roll with a right hand, exit a roll with a left hand. And I was constantly moving up and down to get the majority of what I'm playing in place. So uh, with that said, at this point I want to open it up. Uh, Dr. Hayward uh, can come back in maybe and uh, we have uh, some opportunities here for some question and answer. I would prefer that this be as interactive as you guys can and want to be. So please go ahead and, and pop that question into the chat and uh, Dr. Hayward and I will talk about it. Uh, so the first question was regarding practicing without an instrument. So we have a, we've prepared a couple of links for you um, that are resources. One is to build kind of your own uh, practice pad with duct tape. And then the second one is actually a, a more recent invention. Uh, it's actually a, like a full size 4.3 marimba keyboard practice banner. So yep. those links are in the chat right now. Do you want to talk about those just for a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the uh, duct tape marimba came, uh, has been, some variation of that has been around for quite a long time. Um, I remember um, when I was teaching at United Percussion, so this is probably 2009 or maybe 2010, I forget what season this girl uh, started with us. But she, uh, she actually went to the, her, her school, because she didn't have a marimba at home to practice on, with a giant white sheet and put a white sheet over top of the marimba and with a Sharpie outlined all of the notes so that she could take that home. She put it on a dining room table and she would practice rhythms and notes and spacing and all those things using that sheet on a dining room table. Uh, obviously, if you're gonna do that, Make sure that it's okay with your parents if you are still living at home. Um, there's a, you can put it on a bed, you can put it on the floor. Um, so the, the duct tape marimba is just a, uh, a variation on that, essentially. You get a large piece of cardboard and you use pieces of duct tape to simulate the, the keys. So that gives you, you're not going to get a tonal response. You're not going to be able to hear whether or not you're playing the right notes, but you can do things to work on your dexterity and your spacing. So, uh, especially, excuse me, especially when you get into playing with four mallets, you know, this is an octave in the, in the high oct in the third octave of the marimba getting the muscle memory of that so that you know how it feels. When you get back to a uh, actual physical instrument, you may need to make small adjustments to that, but you're not starting from scratch when you get there. So it really helps from that perspective. Um, I've been running some Zoom rehearsals with our marching band in hopes that we're gonna be able to have a season this year. And one of the things that the pit is doing is they're working on uh, stickings and four mallet permutations and stuff like that on any hard surface. Working on different combinations of things, again, dining room table, floor, drum pad, any of those things so for the stickings uh, and, the, and then the spacing and all that comes from something like a duct tape marimba, a sheet where you can outline the, the actual notes. Um, and the practice banners that Dr. Hayward, I think, just put in the chat is a similar thing to that. Um, I think they're 40 or $50, something like that, uh, that a uh, percussionist who is uh, also in a, some kind of graphic design kind of medium decided to do that. As, and he really was marketing it when it came out uh, when the pandemic hit and everybody was doing remote learning and everything else, because we know, you know a marimba is not an inexpensive instrument. It's not, a, it's not one that every percussionist in high school and middle school 
has at home available to them. So these banners are a very affordable variation on the same theme, the duct tape marimba, the sheet, whatever like that. So uh, we have another question. Uh, do you have any tips for those who are transferring from piano to playing a mallet instrument? Okay, so I have uh, done that as well. The, the, the premise here for, for that is uh, working on the technique a lot. You already know where the notes are. Uh, the spacing is going to need some work. You're going to need to learn how far away notes are because you're used to feeling it. It's a tactile instrument. But the technique is the big thing. So for you, I would be less worried at first about where I'm playing and focused way more on how I'm playing. This is a great opportunity to spend a lot of time on a drum pad or some other practice surface like that and work on the upstrokes that I was talking about earlier. Uh, I kind of glossed over that, so I'm going to very quickly go through the, the primary stroke types that percussionists know. Upstroke starts up and ends up a downstroke which ends down and then there's uh, ver various people have different names for these things. Uh, for, the, for this purpose I'm just going to call them by what the before and after is. So up, up, starts up, ends up. Down, down, starts down, ends down. Down, up, starts down and lifts up. This is the type of note that you would need right before a dynamic change or an accent. And then a down, up, which, uh, I'm sorry, an up, down, which starts up and ends in the down position. This is for a dynamic shift downwards or after an accent or something like that. I would spend a lot of time focused on the different stroke types because coming from piano, this is going to be your biggest challenge. And the keyboard layout generally comes easier to, to people, in my experience, coming from piano to mallets, because it's just a matter of taking what you know and kind of blowing it up and expanding it a little bit. I hope that helps. If you have follow-ups, please feel free to throw them in the chat. Uh, another question. Do you think it's, it's kind of an opinion thing as well. Uh, would you transfer a pianist or a percussionist to mallet player when they enter uh, as a high school freshman and why? So the question, the, the premise of the question is one or the other, like if I had to choose one to choose, it would be a piano, or a pianist or a, perc a percussionist? I think that's it, yeah. Okay. There are, there are so many variables on that one. Um, that it's really difficult for me to say. Um, at my program and in many programs, the marching band is the first thing that happens. It starts over the summer. Uh, you have the battery and the front ensemble that are often doing two very different things. Um, so uh, in, in my experience, it depends on the year, uh, the, the kids that we already have in the program, um, what other kids are coming into the program. Um, and a lot of marching band programs nowadays have synthesizer players, so we can use piano players on their primary instrument as well. Um, in other programs where you start on a concert approach, um, I generally, I believe in a full percussionist. Um, one day early in the school year, I always do a, a large master class with all of the percussionists in my concert ensembles. And I make sure that they all have the general premise of how to play timpani and mallets and crash cymbals and triangle and snare drum and bass drum and everything else that you can imagine. So, I, I can't give a firm answer without knowing all of the details of that situation, but I would generally say that um, I have had 
more luck early getting a pianist to play mallets than I have getting a drummer with no mallet percussion experience to play mallets. I've had success stories both ways, so it, it really depends on the specifics of the situation. So I'm, I'm sorry to not give a, a dead answer to that one, but uh, it depends on, on the circumstances. But in general, uh, I'm also a believer in every kid that wants to be in the, in the program should be in the program. So I pull, I'll put them both on a mallet instrument. If I don't have enough mallet instruments, I'll put two of them on a single marimba. You know, uh, I want every kid to be able to participate, so. I know it's not a direct answer. I'm sorry about that, but that's my feeling on that. No, I think that's good. Um, one more question before we get into uh, a student performance. Um, let me see, we got a couple. And this question will probably end up being hit tomorrow in our events, more intermediate advanced session. When do you, <clears throat> excuse me, when do you start a mallet player practicing for mallet technique? Um, again, not to skirt the, the, the question, but when they're ready. Um, it's, it's hard to say exactly when they're ready. Uh, like I can't give a specific uh, delineation of when the student is or is not ready. Um, uh, honestly, with, with the front ensembles that I teach uh, at the high school level, um, I'm taking kids that have no mallet percussion experience, teaching them mallets on day one of band camp, and I'm teaching them four mallets by day three of band camp. It's simple. It's things like just holding the mallets and being able to play a single chord slowly and really start developing the technique on how to do that nice and slow and just getting comfortable with the idea of it. Um, so generally I do take those students and, and push them along to four mallets relatively quickly, but it also depends on a lot of things. Um, you know, some younger students, because of the way four mallets work, especially with Steven's grip, which is my preferred grip, these back two fingers are responsible for a mallet and uh, some really young students don't have enough musculature but down there yet to control this mallet. So they simply can't do Steven's grip yet. Burton grip is a little bit easier for that. Um, but that's, uh, I try to do it as quickly as I can. Uh, when, when I'm in a concert setting, uh, when I'm working with a wind ensemble or an orchestra where I'm performing, uh, if somebody hands me a mallet part, I am almost always sight reading with four mallets in my hands. Even if it's not a four mallet part, I have found that because I have the dexterity and because I know how to use them, some things just become easier because I have the option of four mallets. So, um, you know, I'm a believer in doing that as quickly as possible but uh, that also requires some buildup before we get there. So, the, again, skirting the answer, it's when they're ready, but generally as quickly as I can. Okay, I think that's good for questions. Um, I believe we have a middle school student that is going to be playing today. So let me get her situated. Uh, I see another Q&A on here. Do you want me to answer this one? Yeah, while we're getting set up. Uh, should whole notes and half notes be rolled or played and let resonate, especially if not notated what to do specifically? Again, there's some gray area in here. Um, in most modern works, if it's not written to play a role, I will not roll. Um, there are few exceptions, and, and there are some pieces that will stay at the beginning of the piece. Like I've seen a piece that will have all quarter notes, whole notes, and, ha and 
uh, half notes that will stay at the beginning, all notes rolled. And then it's just not writing the three slashes or the trill sign or anything like that, just to make it less cumbersome to view. But my default is, unless it says to roll, I don't roll. And when are you ready? Yes. Okay. Can you see me? Yes. yes. Okay. So uh, I will play the Sonatina, the major nine to the major twelve. So this is the uh, middle school all state solo uh, Sonatina. Yes. The major nine to major twelve. Yes. So first of all, I want to thank you for being brave and coming on here and, and playing for us. Um, so a couple of recommendations right off the bat. First of all, I think that was great. All the notes were right. All the rhythms were right. Um, my, the first thing is, personally, I would play the second note of this, of measure 9 and measure 11, with a left hand. Let me turn off my mic. Using that left hand on the second note means that you're going to end on that lowest note also being a left. So you're not going to have to do an unnecessary crossover at the bottom. It's a personal preference. If you're more comfortable with the right, it's not a wrong answer. It's just what my recommendation would be based on my experience. Um, and the other thing that I would say is watch the length of a roll. So if both of the rolls measure 10 and measure 12. I'm going based on memory here in a second. I'll just look and, and make sure that I'm right. Um, both of those rolls are quarter notes. rest. So make sure that you are doing only a quarter note. I think the first one was the one that was on D in measure 10, but the one that was on E in measure 12, you played that one for much longer than a quarter note. Let me make sure that I have it here. Yeah, both of them are quarter notes. The other thing that I would say uh, is, and this is, this is the last thing I'll say about this for, for today, make sure that you're doing the dynamics as well. So just looking at it quickly here, it's forte at the beginning, and then over beats three and four, it diminuendos down to piano. So you want to be louder. Oh, let me turn this off again so I don't break the speakers. So don't be afraid to really exaggerate that dynamic difference. And that'll really make it sound much more musical as well. Uh, this part, I, I was actually talking to Dr. Hayward about this before we started. Based on a quick look at the piece, which this is a piece I've never played before, this is actually measure nine and measure 11 are the two hardest measures in this entire piece. It's deceptive. When you're a mallet player, it's all in C major. So it's the e those two measures are probably the easiest two to learn, to, to put to memory, because you just start on C and go down to B. You start on D, go down to C. So 
to put to memory, these are probably the two easiest measures in the piece. But to play accurately, they're probably the two hardest because you don't have any checkpoints. The piece that I played earlier, uh, box violin, concerto, and A minor, A minor and C major, which is what this is in, are uh, relative mi major and minor to each other. They both have no flats and no sharps. So you don't have any checkpoints. You don't have somewhere where like, you know, all right, my right hand has to come out and play the E flat and then I keep going. There's nothing like that. You're just looking at essentially a blank canvas. So C major is actually deceptively one of the hardest to play accurately while being the easiest to actually learn. So, um, you know, keep working that up. You, obviously, you have some speed still to go on that. Um, I would spend some time w when you decide if you're going to take my left sticking advice or stick with the right hand. I would spend some time making sure that you know where the checkpoints are. So, for instance, when the diminuendo starts. So, you have the beginning. Uh, I'm going to switch to some softer mallets here so that I don't have to mute myself. Beginning is forte. The first two beats goes down to the C below the first C. That C is where you start the diminuendo. So knowing that that's on a left hand and then from there down, you're going to make your diminuendo happen. That gives you a, a checkpoint in there that's, um, that gives you something tangible to lock, lock on to. If you stick with your right hand, then it will be on your right hand. But either way, you know, make sure that you know where some of those checkpoints are. And that's going to help you with note accuracy and playing this musically as well. When do you want to uh, play that phrase again? Mm -hmm. Trying to incorporate some of the advice that was given by Mr. Wyatt? Okay. That was much better with the second quarter note roll. You stopped it after one beat, so that was a good improvement there. You chose to stick with the right hand, which is a perfectly acceptable choice, like I said before. So that's fine, and that's something I wouldn't expect you to do on the fly anyway. You'd have to work on that. I think your forte can still be louder so that you can make a bigger difference when you come soft. I'm hearing the difference, but to me, that sounds mezzo piano to piano, not forte to piano. Good job. Thank you. Okay. Right. Um, any more questions from the audience? Uh, do you have any uh, beginner mallet recommendations? Uh, is the question regarding pieces or uh, the actual mallets? Let's give it a moment and see yeah. if she responds. Actual mallets. OK. Um, so this is a great time to be a beginner mallet player because there are so many companies out there. Personally, I am a Vic Firth educator. I love Vic Firth mallets. I've been using Vic Firth my whole life. Uh, everything I have in front of me right now here is Vic Firth. Um, there's a lot of great companies out there too. There's a lot of great uh, brands, a lot of great models. Um, the one that I was using for today on Marimba is the, the primary one I was using anyway, was the Giff Howarth M163. This is kind of like a medium hard. It's, it gives you a lot of um, diverse playing on a Marimba. Um, when you're a first-year player, it also depends on what instrument you're playing. 
you know, uh, at a middle school, for instance, you might not have a marimba because marimba is not a popular instrument in middle school band repertoire quite yet. Uh, xylophone is much more popular. So there are some uh, good um, xylophone mallets out there. Um, I wasn't quite prepared with a, a list of good beginner mallets off the top of my head here, so uh, I don't have model numbers specifically to give you. But what I will say is, if you want a more detailed answer, uh, Dr. Hayward, would it be okay for them to email you and I can... Yeah, if you want to compile a, a list and then I can make it available, uh, especially when we post a video and, and send it out to the people who have signed up for this uh, workshop as well. Yeah, I'll be happy to do that. Put in a couple of options for xylophone, vibraphone, marimba, uh, beginner mallets. Um, yeah, I, because I, I want to help, but I, I was not prepared for that type of question on this this uh, webinar here. Any other questions? When do you have any questions? We'll see if any more come in. Do you have any other talking points that you would like to go over, uh, Mr. Wyatt? Um, not particularly, no. Um, I do make a couple of small adjustments to what I just talked about uh, when I'm working in the marching setting. You know, when I was teaching independent groups, drum corps, uh, the, my marching band, my percussion group, things like that. Uh, there, there are some slight alterations. The big thing that I will say at all times with regards to technique is there are a lot of right answers. Something I say might be disagreed with by your personal instructor or your private uh, teacher or anything like that. So the technique is that there are a lot of right answers. The way I taught you in this webinar was how I teach the beginning technique. Other people will say other things, and those are all okay. Um, the big thing is when you are in a group setting, especially in the marching world, uh, drum corps, independent, uh, winter percussion, indoor percussion, those things, you know, you do want to, the idea is that everybody plays with the same technique, so you may need to make adjustments to your personal technique to work with a group like that. But that's not always that's not necessarily a bad thing either. It's enabling you to put more techniques into your bag of tricks that make your sound you. Did I just see another question pop up? Uh, what's a good warm up for the weaker hand, left hand? Um, so I did say at the beginning that I like doing one octave scales because they work really n nicely left hand lead. So on and so forth through all the keys. Doing left hand lead on all of those helps you get the left hand stronger. Um, the thing that I would always say with regards to using your left hand, uh, within reason, everything you can do right-handed, you should be able to do left-handed as well. Um, you know, one of the things I did on drum set, for instance, was I, I learned how to play cross-handed like most drum set players do. But after I got really good at that, I went back and taught myself how to do it open-handed and make my left hand the hi-hat hand just to make myself more versatile and more able to do various things. So, you know, if you play, you know, one of the popular things is the green scales. There's a lot of variations of that, but some version of that. Do it left-hand lead. You know, there's, there's a lot of possibilities there. 
put yourself in a position that makes you focus on your left hand, whatever it is that you do. Okay, any final questions? Just a second. I think that might be everything. Yeah. Well, okay. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, that wraps up session number five of the Kaiser Music Series. Please tune in tomorrow at three. We have uh, Mr. Wyatt back again. He's going to do an intermediate advanced session, talk more about the, the four mallet technique. Uh, so everyone, thank you, Mr. Michael Wyatt, for your wonderful information and have a great day.